so i believe uh, we will be starting the session from 11:05 so just wait for like 2 to 3 minutes so that yeah, everyone can settle down uh hello everyone and this is om prakash so host of the event and uh, i like to welcome each and everyone who find time and for this learning session other than this uh, this particular uh, meetup is now have the strength of 2000 plus members so thank you for your uh, support and love and we will be continuing this journey on every month basis uh, and new topics every month so <clears throat> for this time uh, we have covered uh, say for uh, almost uh, 10 design patterns and for and as per the gang of four uh, the list is uh, almost 23 so we will be having one more uh, session which will cover the rest so i will be happy if you guys are able to find time for the same welcome again yeah if you have anything in mind or you want to share something so please go ahead um shall we start yes ajim yeah <clears throat> okay cool so yeah yeah uh, okay so yeah hi everyone so on the notes is uh, uh learning meetup so this is our third chapter and uh, on the first chapter was for, for the basic notes second was advanced and here we are covering design pa design patterns and here uh uh experience okay experience like uh, okay maybe we can cover the questions and the last so here uh, we will be covering the design patterns so basically for node js and javascript so here uh, akshay uh, akshay and azim will be presenting so azim uh, you are presenting first right yes yes yeah so please go ahead yeah so hello everyone good morning and uh, yeah i'm azim and I am a software engineer at Talentica, and today, me along with Akshay uh, will be presenting some of the design patterns uh, which we can implement, not just in Node.js. Just uh, we'll discuss uh, the concepts, underlying concepts of design patterns, and what design patterns are and everything. Cool. So, okay. So first, I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, Sunny Kumar and OP for organizing this event. uh they literally uh, gave us all the material we need and they made sure that uh, we hit all our milestones like preparing for slides having uh, internal rehearsals and all that <laughs> i mean without them we would uh, i mean this wouldn't have happened in time so thanks op and sunny and uh, thank you all who joined uh, <laughs> sacrificing their precious weekend time uh, at least i hope uh, it will be a worthwhile going through this session cool uh with that out of the way let's see 
so agenda for this talk uh, or in other words uh, by the end of this talk uh, i mean you, you all should have uh, i mean you all should at least be able to describe what design patterns are and how can we classify different types of design patterns and uh, some of the specific uh, i mean design patterns like name with with the names like you'll get to know what singletons are prototypes are and factory method patterns are and builder patterns are and all that so by the end of this session you should be able to confidently describe what all of this means so today uh, we'll be covering uh, two common types of design patterns creational design patterns and uh, behavioral design patterns and i uh, will be going through behavioral design patterns and akshay he'll be covering creational design patterns and he'll be describing what design patterns are cool moving on so uh, yeah we do require some of you all to i mean uh, you all to understand have a basic understanding of javascript and some a little bit of working knowledge with nodejs doesn't have to be nodejs any object oriented programming language will work but yeah so experience with yeah object oriented programming environment and yeah okay so before getting started throughout this uh, session we'll be using the term like object a lot so i assume that most of you all know what object oriented programming is and what objects are but anyway we'll have a quick brush up so that uh, uh, moving on you won't be confused whenever we use term objects and uh, some other properties so we all know that uh, before object oriented programming we had uh, procedural programming wherein we had properties uh, we had a program and in the program we had a property and a function so all of these uh, when uh, all of these were stored in a variables and it was uh, all of this was stored in variables in like a random way and all of the variables and functions used to be decoupled so as the application grows we might uh, face a situations like we have to extend some of the functionalities of existing functions we have to use existing variables in some different functions so uh, as we grow we will uh, face this kind of situation where we end up with a lot of new methods and most of those methods have some sorts of common code in them so what will happen is uh, if we need to make a change in one method uh, we'll have to end up refactoring all the methods uh, and Uh, it will make our uh, program very vulnerable for bugs if we miss one method updating one method when we refactored one function we might end up uh, uh, with a nasty bug in our program so to tackle this there was a object oriented programming there is object oriented programming and in here what we do is we combine a uh, uh, a relatable properties and methods in one unit and this unit we call it an object okay doing this uh, it uh, it magically makes our code extremely easier to go through and uh, it solves a lot of problems and it uh, exposes some interesting properties like encapsulation inheritance and we'll look into them as we move so as you can see uh, an example of procedural programming here uh, consider a simple example here where we need to uh, get a wage of a employee so here we have a base salary of that employee and uh, overtime in hours and the rate per hour okay and we have a method which takes in all the three uh, properties as parameters and based on that it returns uh, the Com cumulative amount, cumulative salary for that employee. So as you can see, that uh, it, it it's a simple method, but uh, uh, compared to that, compared to how we refactored it here, we've encapsulated <clears throat> all these properties: base salary, overtime rate, in an object, and along with that, 
we have a method in in an object <coughs> uh, which does the same exact thing but it doesn't take in any parameters here right so since uh, all the parameters this method requires are part of this uh, are a logical part of this object it can directly calculate it and return the result so uh, now our console log i mean if we when we want to get the result it just uh, it just going to be a matter of doing this dot get fetch without any parameters so you can see the benefits of this right so first thing is when dealing with a a, a code a, a method a function with the lesser parameters is always favorable and it's very manageable compared to the ones with a lot of uh, parameters in it and uh, yeah it interestingly here we don't have to expose uh, some of the properties which could be private like base salary or rate uh, to a method right so it 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 gives us that uh, that features so moving on uh, so other some of some of the other interesting properties which object oriented programming exposes are encapsulation which we already saw just now we can encapsulate all the pro related properties and methods in a object a unit and uh, it helps us reduce complexity and promotes uh, reusability and then there is abstraction like again here abstraction simply means that if we need to define some other properties which we need internally for uh, for some of the uh, methods or calculations we don't have to expose those properties to uh, outside we can just use them internally so that our uh, interface will be clean and uh, any changes which we make to the new uh, internal properties uh, that change won't require the clients who use this method to change anything there right so abstraction reduces the complexity and isolates the impacts of changes and then there is inheritance right so when we uh, combine all the related elements in a logical unit what we can do is uh, we can for if there is another uh, set of object which needs this object uh, so it can uh, have a one single point of where it can extend that object from so it eliminates a lot of redundant code and then there is polymorphism and what polymorphism basically means is uh, for example there are different sorts of objects like this one maybe the other get there is another object it it will also have another get page method and uh, that get page method might not take over time or rate it might just take in base salary or some other comp of early related data and then return the age i mean return the wage uh, so what's going to happen is uh, polymorph polymorph with the polymorphism we eliminate uh, if else and switch cases and depending on the data which we get in uh, a constructor object i mean the parameter uh, we can return the result without having to <coughs> change anything uh, or fact i mean having a uh, long conditions of if else and switch case statements so we'll be looking more into as we move along with our code we'll see uh, when we go through our uh, demos and implementation how all of these uh, benefits are applied in action so this is just a quick brush up of what object oriented programming is and moving on you should be clear with the term terminologies which we use so now um, i will hand over uh to akshay to continue with the design patterns okay uh, thank you azim uh, i'll share my screen yeah okay uh, i hope uh, you can see my screen so hello everyone my name is akshay i am a software engineer at talentica software sputen so uh what exactly are design patterns well uh that every day we we are building softwares and we are usually presented with a lot of challenging problems uh, problems that me might have already solved so 
uh, to solve the problem once and for all uh, with an improved solution a pattern uh, a solution that you can use over and over so uh, its uh, design patterns are reusable reliable solutions to the problem that we face every day in our software development now uh, the question is why we need design patterns okay so uh, design patterns are named catalog solutions they are well tested and uh, reusable in many different situations then uh, they are well documented so that other developers can learn them and they are easy to talk about with other engineers who already know them uh, so it's a language for a uh, collaboration uh, then uh, they can uh, make our code better and your applications are less brittle to bugs okay then uh, it's easier to add new features or modules to applications where we use them although uh, some uh, design patterns are all difficult to learn first uh, we can uh, write them with a simple code okay and ultimately by knowing design patterns we can become a bit better programmer okay right and every programmer wants to write a better code code and reflect on better ways of writing the codes so that's why we need design patterns uh, then a little about uh, history of uh, design patterns so in 1994 a uh, gang of four that means uh, uh, four authors were were wrote uh, the book elements of reusable object oriented software which covered the design patterns classical 23 design patterns okay so the gang of four provided a clear definition of software design patterns and outlined their required parts so uh, each pattern must have a name the name describes the problem and the solution uh, in only a couple of words then a solution must also be clearly stated uh, it describes when the pattern should be used and uh, along with that uh, it should have some uh, trade offs or consequences of using that patterns so that's what a uh, gang of four defined design patterns now uh, there comes a classical design patterns uh, which are basically categorized into three part uh, three categories like creational structural and behavioral uh, so in creational design patterns uh, they have to do with uh, class instantiation and creation of object instances in our applications uh, then structural design patterns have to do with the way objects are uh, composed or put together and uh, behavioral design patterns define how objects interact with one another so uh, in today's session uh, we will be covering uh, creational design patterns and behavioral design patterns okay uh, now uh, design patterns are not only uh, limited to object oriented programming so there are some other uh, popular design patterns in uh, like module callback middleware reactor blockchain scheduler and publisher subscriber and there are a lot of uh, other patterns which are Uh, you know developed almost every day in our uh, software development okay so uh, let's start with uh, creational design patterns so we'll start with singleton pattern so uh, uh, by gang of four single singleton pattern ensures a class only has one instance and provide a global point of access to it okay uh, so this is a simple uml diagram for singleton pattern so what it said uh, suppose uh, there is one db connection uh, which we want to provide throughout the uh, our application so i'll need a, a one insta only one instance of that uh, db connection that should be used across my uh, globally across my application okay uh, so we'll uh, quickly look into uh, the example with a demo so uh, we'll see how this uh, problem of A class instantiation of multiple objects. Say the code. Okay. Suppose uh, I have one logger class. So what it does? Uh, it uh, instead of logging uh, logs to our console dot log, I want a log log method which can uh, Uh, which can push all the messages with timestamp into our 
array, array of logs. Okay. So a uh, cl uh, class logger has a constructor, then uh, it has a count of all total logs and a method to uh, push, push the message and timestamp into our logs array. Okay. And uh, we have exported this class. Then I have one other, other class, uh, sh shopper class, uh, which essentially use the logger class. Okay. Uh, creates an instance of logger class. And uh, this shopper constructor has a name and money. So by creating this shopper class, we will have a shopper name and money in that account. Uh, similarly, for a store class, uh, we are importing, uh, we are creating a class of uh, class object of cl class logger. And this class store has a constructor which uh, essentially has a, a new store name and has inventory link items in their store. Okay, now in our client uh, code, like uh, index.js, uh, I have logger class and shopper class and store class. Uh, I'm importing them, then created a new instance of logger class and created a, a two objects. Uh, first is shopper class, uh, Alex with a, a shopper class and store for a sky, sky shop uh, variable okay, object. So uh, if, I, if I run this code, Okay, so uh, the array is storing only two logs here, okay? First one is uh, starting at and finished config. So what, uh, what happening here is, uh, it's just using the instance which was uh, inside in, the, uh, in this index, index file only. So we are unable to capture logs which were present in store and uh, shopper class. So uh, here comes the problem of, uh, class instantiation with multiple objects and we are not able to use uh, the same instance across the application. Okay, so how to uh, solve this problem? Uh, so in object oriented programming, uh, we usually create a, uh, we'll create a class singleton and have a constructor, uh, which will tell us that if uh, there is not a singleton instance of this class, then we will return a new new logger class, uh, object of new logger class. And it will have a one method to get the instance and it, it will essentially return the singleton instance of this class uh, whenever it is demanded. Okay. So uh, we are importing a singleton class now instead of logger and uh, here we will be uh, in shopper, shopper class, we will use the method new log, uh, method of get instance from logger class, okay? And similarly for store. Uh, now if I run this code. Okay, uh, now you can see that uh, we are able to capture all uh, four logs in total for uh, in uh, logs app, uh, logs array. Okay, so it has uh, started the app, then created a new shopper and a new store. Okay, and finish the config. So uh, now we are able to uh, create a single instance of class throughout the execution. Uh, now uh, for in Node.js, uh, you know, in object oriented programming, creating this. Uh, singleton class with get instance method and uh, importing it, uh, it's very uh, yeah, trivial. So in Node.js, we have a mechanism of, we have mechanism of caching. Okay, so uh, what the idea here is that uh, we will be, uh, when we run this file, uh, okay, now what, what we have done, uh, we are just exporting, uh, exporting the new logger class, okay. So when we run this file, uh, it will run once, then we'll, it will create a new instance of the logger and we'll save it in, in the cache. So that means that uh, Node, in Node.js, it will automatically 
handle exporting the same instance of logger uh, class to every other modules like shopper and store okay so that's how a singleton pattern works in node nodes so we saw a singleton problem of uh, instantiating multiple objects and then uh, its solution by creating a single instance throughout the execution and how a module caching mechanism is helpful in nodejs okay uh, now moving to prototype pattern so uh, it specifies the kinds of objects to create using prototypical instance and create new objects by copying this prototype so i will explain this with a uh, simple example so in cities like pune uh, we have we live in apart apartments okay uh, so they have fixed configurations like 1 bhk 2 bhk 3 bhk and all so uh, they are essentially uh, each house is essentially a copy or a clone of a uh, master design like one uh, whatever configuration it has okay so uh, in prototype uh, we also uh, the problem that we face in prototype uh, uh, problem says uh, object creation is repetitive and costly okay so uh, let's look at an example okay suppose i have one uh, shopper class which has a constructor then getters and setters for a shopper name and it has one shopping uh, shopping list and a method to add items to the items to that list okay now in in index index file uh, i created two instances of this shopper class uh, one is with alex and with dev so and i am adding these items to their list so for alex i have added a knife tent backpack map and slingshot and for you i have added a uh, ca camping knife tent backpack map and reading light so here we can see that uh, i am repeating the items that that needs to be added to this item list okay so uh, it, uh, we are duplicating the same code and both even alex have uh, all these common items so uh, what we can do we can uh, save time and reduce redundancy by implementing prototype patterns so let's look how how this can be simplified so instead of importing shopper what i will do i will create one uh, object instance named with scout okay and i will import this scout uh, scout prototype which will essentially have all this atom already added to this list okay so in index file uh, i have import this imported scout prototype and then i'm using a clone clone method okay clone method to import all this uh, list items for the uh, for the alex query object and similarly for ev object and i'm adding the uh, some configured items like slingshot or reading light to to the objects respectively uh, now uh, we'll see how this clone method can be implemented Uh, right. So we have uh, removed the eliminated the uh, redundant code and we are very uh, complicated objects now. Uh, we, we have removed the complicated object creation. Okay. So in clone method, uh, uh, what I am saying. Uh, so in a variable uh, proto equals to object get prototype of this. So uh, this will give me the prototype of the current shopper object. Okay. and then object dot create proto this will uh, create a new object of on the fly and add the current prototype of the current instance to that object okay now a current shopping list and a current name is also cloned by creating copies of this uh, values those values uh, also we are using a spread a spread prototype or spread operator and i can copy all the values from uh, this uh, shopping list to our cloned shopping list 
and I will return the cloned object. So, uh, and there can be uh, multiple uh, methods to implement this clone method. Uh, but this is a simple one we can come up with. Okay. So, uh, what I'm doing, uh, I will just import the scout prototype. Then, uh, while creating object, I will just call this clone method so that all the items that were that were common to the list will be automatically added. Okay. Now let's look how, let's try to execute this code. Okay, so we can see that uh, Alex has camping knife, tent, backpack, map, and slingshot, and Eva camping knife, tent, backpack, map, and living light. Okay. So that's how a prototype pattern helps us to uh, remove the redundant code. Okay, so what we saw, uh, we saw the problem uh, of objectivation in repeat is repetitive and costly. Then we solved it using a clone method for prototype pattern, so as a prototype pattern solution. Okay, so uh, moving ahead, uh, in object creation, uh, in creational pattern, uh, there is uh, another pattern like a uh, factory method pattern. So it defined as an uh, interface for creating an object, but uh, let subclasses decide which class to instantiate. So a factory method lets the class decide which uh, uh, defer the instantiation to subclasses, okay? So uh, let's look at this uh, diagram. So suppose uh, I have a, a person class and a person can be student and instructor, okay? So uh, every time I need to uh, create a objects of uh, this student and instructor class, then uh, I will, I will, uh, you know, note all the details like which which class I'm uh, going to, the object of which class I'm going to create. Okay, so instead of that, uh, if I create a factory of persons and I just uh, pass the type of that person like student or instructor and I get the object, then it will be uh, easier for the client and also it will not expose the implementation details. Okay, so uh, let's look at uh, demo. What is the factor problem? So we can say that uh, for a person class, I am returning a name, name of the person to the string with the help of string method. Then I have a shopper, which basically extends the person and have a name and money with them. Okay. And employee, Employee is also extension from employees extension from a shopper. It uh, essentially has a name, money, and uh, employer employer name. Okay, and also has a payday like how much money they have. Okay. So in index class, uh, suppose I use this shopper and employee uh, objects with L for Alex and you. Then I'm passing all the parameters and also uh, decide deciding which which object. I need to create, okay? And we are directly using the uh, classes name in our client application, okay? So instead of that, if I use, if I create a user factory, okay? And uh, it will also have, a, uh, it will also import employee and shopper classes. Uh, but uh, now we are passing a type of person, like whether it's employee, it's shopper, or there can be other type of persons. Maybe he's, a, he's an engineer, developer, manager, or whatever. Okay. So in, if you use this uh, user factory, then uh, at a client level, I just need to uh, import the user factory class and I will uh, pass the type of uh, that use a uh, person, like it's employee, employee or uh, any other like shopper, or engineer. So by uh, doing this, uh, we are directly 
uh, within our client application, we are going to use factory method instead of uh, original classes. And I will uh, let the factory decide which which type of class we need to create, like which for which uh, object it will be, whether it will return employee or shopper. Okay. So I'll uh, run this code. Uh, so now we can see that uh, we have created two objects for Alex and you. So Alex have money and uh, is not employed. So it's just a shopper. And Eve is he has money equals to 200, is employed. And employer name is this and that. So this will be helpful if you have a lot of uh, persons that we need to create. Suppose there are hundreds of uh, classes that we need. So using the using uh, such type of factory will help to uh, hide all the encapsulations, uh, hide all the details from the client. Okay. So what factory does? Uh, so problem is when we create an object, uh, we expose the logic. So the solution is to provide a com common interface like user factory to create new objects. Right, so uh, moving to build a pattern. So uh, build a pattern essentially separates the construction of complex objects from its representation. So that uh, same construction process can create a different representation. So uh, it's kind of clumsy statement. Okay. So we'll directly look into uh, example. So a builder pattern essentially, I will show you what is the problem in this. Now, uh, suppose I have one a person class, which has a constructors, a, a constructor and has property uh, uh, parameter set like name, is he employee, is manager, hours, money and shopping list. Okay. And it will return all this, uh, properties to the when whenever we create this person class okay so when when i create a objects for this person so uh, suppose i need to create an employee then i will pass parameters like uh, name then his employee uh, he whether he is a manager and okay and when i uh, create a shop shopper is shopper object then i will also need to check what are the sequence of this parameters and uh, what are they actually mean okay so uh, whenever i create a object for shoppers then i will check whether i will pass the name then whether is a, a manager is employee then number of hours money and shopping list so such type of problem when uh, there are a lot of parameters that we are passing uh, to Creator object is referred to as a telescoping constructor anti pattern. And uh, to solve this problem, uh, use, uh, we have created a builder pattern solution. So, which essentially creates the, it will create a properties for this uh, parameters. Instead of using parameters, we will create a properties and we will chain them and use them while creating an object. And we can solve this uh, anti-pattern or uh, telescoping constructor anti-pattern using such type of uh, implementation. Okay. So uh, you can see that uh, uh, previously we were uh, creating object by passing all the parameters to the object, person object, person class. And uh, when we create, instead of passing the parameters, uh, if I create a lot of uh, properties like make employee, then make manager, 
okay and i i i implement them in the class itself okay the person class so that will uh, that will be easy to create classes and also as a developer you will not need to look into what uh, these parameters mean or what is the syntax of the parameters okay so uh, we will see how to implement a person a person builder class so uh, in this builder uh, class i will have all the properties so make employee will return whether it's uh, employee or not make manager will uh, essentially return whether it's manager and the num uh, number of hours okay and a uh, lot of other properties so imagine a scenario where i have uh, 50 to 100 properties that uh, that needs to be that that are required when we create a object uh, then it will be easier to create using this proper such type of properties okay so let's uh, run this code okay so uh, i have created uh, employ uh, okay so i have created a few uh, objects here so uh, you can see that uh, sue is uh, having is an employee is true then his manager is true number of person mari and shopping list and uh, similar for chaldis <clears throat> okay now uh, this build function that uh, that we saw so this build method will essentially return the object uh, of this created class of this instance of this class okay new person of this and it will have all these properties carried out uh, to this to to this person object okay uh, so we saw in a uh, builder pattern uh, there is a problem of telescoping constructor anti pattern which is uh, related to having multiple parameters uh, when we construct any object and uh, we can solve this by reducing the parameters to the properties and uh, we are essentially making it highly read uh, readable method calls and it's very useful for any software developer to uh, you know scale the scale that class or application moving forward okay okay so uh, th this was all about uh, creational design patterns uh, if you have any questions uh, please jot down into a uh, chat window uh, related to creational patterns and, and i will ask uh, azim uh, i'll hand over to azim uh, for the further behavioral patterns examples okay as in to you yeah thanks akshay cool mm. sorry can you guys see my screen just yeah as in we can see your screen okay cool so 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 far we saw uh, some of the examples of uh, uh, creational design patterns so uh, like we discuss the creation there are three common types of design patterns like creational design patterns structural design patterns and behavioral design patterns a creational have to do with how objects are created and instantiated in our applications structural have to do with how they are put together how different objects are put together in our application and behavioral have to do with how different objects interact with one another so for simple analogy uh, you can compare creational uh, i mean this common design patterns to a you know a, a team right so in a team there can be a role right so uh, deciding a role uh, in a given team uh, which role will be suitable and all that that we can uh, compared to creational design patterns and structural design patterns can be how the entire team uh, is put together with different types of roles in it 
and the behavioral design pattern could be how one team uh, interacts with other teams like for example uh, there can be a development team here in india and there can be a client team so how these two teams interacted uh, interacts with one another and or how two objects interact with one another that has to i mean that uh, behavioral design pattern deals with that so we skip the structural design patterns here and jump straight into behavioral because we are short on time but uh, you will get to know that as well in future talks so moving on uh, so the first design patterns which we'll look into in chain uh, behavioral design patterns is called chain of responsibility so the gang of four they define chain of responsibility i mean let's read this together um the gang of four defines uh, the intent of chain of responsibility pattern as to avoid coupling the sender of a request and its receiver by giving more than one object a chance to handle the request chain the receiving objects and pass the request along the chain until an object handles it so maybe uh, this definition is not that obvious so we'll look into some of the examples which we can relate to so uh considering people related examples uh so imagine an assembly line in a factory okay at least an old kinds of factories where people used to stand near a kind of belt where products uh run through uh and the people standing there would perform a checks on the product if everything's fine and then let the product go by to the next station and if something's wrong then they can discard that product right so here each person acts as an object uh, where they process that uh, product and they can decide whether or not to pass it on to next uh, station and another example could be a uh, customer service calls right so when you call some customer service you'll first face an interface where you will have to dial some sorts of digits where you'll hear some pre recorded messages pre recorded messages pre recorded messages and based on that uh, the that i mean the service will redirect you to a suitable uh, uh, i mean call center executive and if the call center executive is not able to solve your uh, problem then that call center executive might redirect you to some other uh, executive who is well qualified to solve your problem so these are some of the examples related in real life which you can relate to and in programming if some of you have experience uh, developing express uh, in nodejs and you can uh, think of middlewares right in middlewares we can uh, we have a uh, endpoint right and before the endpoint and the final uh, handler which is going to handle the result we can include a lot of um, middlewares or methods which will essentially have the entire control of the request and uh, they can uh, either i mean we can have checks like is user authenticated properly or is user has proper subscription uh, related details and uh, if the request itself is it valid or not so for all these sorts of checks we can have an, a new method which uh, we can chain into a uh, express middlewares and uh, if everything works fine then the request will go to the last i mean final handler and that handler will process the request and will return the result so now that we are done with visualizing how what chain of responsibility actually means so let's look into uh, uh, an example how we can do this in nodejs so <clears throat> consider uh, this file okay here you can see uh, uh, there is inventory so, okay? so basically these are inventories so consider a shop and that shop uh, has some products uh, which you can read here and uh, like ski goggles all the ski related products skiing related products so in that shop's floor as you can see we have four products in the list of the quantities right and uh, maybe in the back room not on the same floor they have some additional products right and uh, not in the shop but uh, in some a uh, local store there are some additional products which the main shop which they might uh, advertise there and there is a warehouse okay 
uh, which is basically where all the products are produced. And uh, these are all the details of products and the quantities. So what our uh, task is, um, given a shop, uh, I mean store, we need to find an element uh, which we give it uh, give it in into a method. Like we'll see. So consider this uh, index file. Here we've instantiated us. I mean we've uh, imported a store, and we have imported an inventory. Inventory is nothing but this file. Okay. And uh, we have uh, in instantiated a new ski shop, which is basically a new instance of a store. Store, and it has its name like Steep and Deep, and uh, the inventory which that store has is its floor, right? <clears throat> so it can quickly access its floor for any product which user demands. So now the user tries to uh, find a ski rack, okay? And uh, what we simply, this fun, this uh, method has a find method. This uh, object has a find method uh, where based on the item, we can search and see if the floor has this item or not. So. As you can see, this item is ski rack. And if we go and look into our floor inventory, uh, you'll see there's no ski rack in, on our floor. And uh, this would uh, return as undefined, right? So moving on, what we can do, what, how we can refactor this code is, uh, we would need uh, some sort of uh, way so that uh, the store can take an entire inventory and if it doesn't find that uh, item in that inventory, it should be smart enough to uh, find that item somewhere else and should be able to uh, intimate the user that, okay, we don't have it right now. We, we might have it in some, in some time. We'll get it from somewhere else like that, okay? So <clears throat> basically this inventory needs to have some sort of chain of responsibility where uh, it would search for the floor first. And then if it doesn't find the in the floor, it would search in the back room and then in the local store and then in the warehouse. Okay, so let's see how we can implement this. Here, we've just refactored our index file to take a complete inventory instead of just floor. And uh, here we're searching for a different item here, powder skis. Okay, let's see where the powder skis is actually. Mm, it's not in here, it's not in here. It's in the warehouse. As you can see, it's in the warehouse. And now, now this result should actually uh, give us, find that element from the warehouse and intimate the user. Okay, it's in the back room. We'll take some time to get uh, this item for you. Okay, let's see how the store has been refactored. Earlier, store was just a simple find method, but since it's taking a new in inventory entirely, let's see how it's uh, refactored. <clears throat> So now, uh, as we can see the store, it uh, is importing a storage, which is not there in the beginning. Uh, so I think we've created a new storage kind of thing. And uh, it has imported that, sto uh, that storage uh, class. And then here, as we can see, it has defined different types of inventories here. Uh, we have floor, which is a new storage. It just takes inventory, uh, I mean, inventory items from the floor. Okay, so floor, backroom, local store, and warehouse are all different types of inventories, right? So it uh, looks like this storage is also taking an additional uh, parameter here. Uh, let's see what that is, okay? So basically, uh, looks like uh, this inventory has something called set next method in it, uh, which uh, I think I, uh, it's going to, if it doesn't find in the floor, it's going to, look for uh, the, this sex, uh, I mean, set next item, which was passed in, right? So it, it's there for every, everyone, every kind of inventory, okay? So now we first instantiated uh, this store to start with flooring, I mean, start with uh, searching the item in the floor. And now <clears throat> there's a method called find. And this uh, method basically uses the find method in the storage uh right so here the floor first storage will be the floor so from the storage find it will try to find the element so let's see what the storage is like okay so i'm not sure if it's clearly visible here let me show you in the code <clears throat> cool 
let me can you see my code like vs code Oh, uh, yeah. see, we can yeah. see. Okay, good. So as we can see, there's a new storage class. Uh, here, the storage basically takes in the name of the uh, inventory and the inventory items and the delivery time. So we've saw the third parameter, right? Which was passed in by initiating, instantiating the storages. So this is, uh, I think it, this, I think looks like a delivery time, okay delivery time for that particular storage. Cool. So we've instantiated all those here and we've something called uh, next property here, which is initially set to null. So now first, whenever a user tries to find an element, this will be invoked, right? And this will be invoked in the floor first. And uh, what this find method is doing is just simply trying to look in the local inventory and local inventory is based on which inventory is the current inventory? What inventory is there in this dot inventory? So this dot inventory could be floor, or it can be warehouse, it can be uh, uh, some other things like local store and backroom, right? So first, it's try it, it's trying to find that item based on the item name uh, in that inventory, and if it found it, if it finds it, uh, it's just uh, returning it, right? So if uh, there's nothing found here, what's going to happen is if, if the item is found, we're just going to return all the details of that item, including the uh, delivery time, which we've uh, extracted from here and the location and all that. And if item is not found, we are looking what the next, uh, this dot next uh, property has in it, right? So we've seen that the store, if it doesn't find in the floor, it has set next uh, to back room. So what the set, set next does basically is just sets the next property to storage, next storage, where to look at. So for floor, it's back room, right? So it uh, just tries to find that item in the next uh, item which was set. Cool. So once all the, I mean, once we uh, go through all the inventories, we would end up here, right? And if we don't find from anywhere else, we would end up here and we will just log that we don't carry this item, right? Hope that all of that is clear. Now let's run our first code, right? Where we didn't implement any storage kind of thing. So let's uh, take this. Let's try to find the ski rack, which was not in the floor, right? Ski rack was not in the floor. Ski rack was in back room. So it should return us um, undefined. Let's see. <clears throat> we are in chain of responsibility. Cool. <clears throat> so moving on, let's see what this does. Next so as you can see, it just returned as undefined, right? So because it couldn't find that uh, the ski rack in floor. So let's uh, uh, see our refactored implementation, okay? So let's close all that for clarification and let's move to refactored code. Here, uh, okay, let's see where ski rag is first. Ski rag is in the back room. So here, as you can see, uh, after refactoring, we should be able to find that element, right? So let's do node index.js here. Now we've seen that uh, we found we found the uh, item ski rack in stores back room. And the delivery time is now because back room is just somewhere close by to the store. Now, so, hello? Yeah, can you guys hear me okay? It showed me that I was on mute. No, no, uh, yeah, we can hear you as you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Just a second. Mm, okay, yeah. So let's try to find an uh, item which is not in either floor, back room, local storage, or uh, but it's there in here, right? So let's see if we can. Yeah, powder skis is not in not in local storage, back room, or floor, right? Let's try to find it, and it should tell us that it's somewhere in the back, uh, somewhere in the warehouse. Yeah. 
So it's telling us that it found that item, but it's in the warehouse and it would take five days. Because we've, uh, if you remember, we've uh, defined that delivery time for warehouse would be five days, right? So this is just a simple example of uh, how chain of responsibility can be implemented, right? Cool. And if we don't, uh, if we pass in something else, like, because it's not ski editor item, it should return. We don't carry Snickers, right? Cool. Let's move on. Mm. Let's close this. Let's be ready for the next one. <clears throat> cool. Moving on. So we've seen uh, the chain of uh, responsibility implementation and uh, we've uh, learned some of the real life examples. Right. So having such sort of implementation in our existing code could really uh, help us uh, uh, clean our code a lot better. If we just, uh, yeah. Mm, yeah, the next pattern, next behavioral pattern, which we'll look at is uh, command pattern. So let's uh, uh, read through the definition which Gang of Four defined the command pattern as, okay? So the Gang of Four defines the intent of command pattern as encapsulating a request as an object, thereby letting you parameterize clients with different requests queue or log requests and support undoable operations. And again, I think this with, with by itself, the definition itself, it's not very clear. So let's uh, see the examples, okay? So first we'll discuss a real life example, okay? So consider uh, a person, a, a customer, he, uh, he visited a restaurant, okay? And let's assume that uh, this in this restaurant, there's no waiter or waitresses, okay? So uh, there's just a chef and the customer. So what's going to happen? Uh, so the, what the chef has to do, chef has to go to the customer, right? And he has to take the order. And if uh, customer has some sorts of allergies, allergies or something, uh, then the chef has to make sure that uh, he, he ensures that He's not uh, adding any uh, condiments related to that. And he has to do all the kind of heavy working, right? So here we have a direct interaction with customer and a chef. And similarly, I mean, uh, in contrast, consider the same with along with the waiter, okay? And now we have a waiter. What waiter is going to do? Waiter is going to uh, come to you. He's going to take the list of all the things which you require and he's going to ask you if there is something uh, you don't want in your food and all that. And he's going to note down all that and he's going to take that note and stick it somewhere so that chef can, chef whenever he's ready, um, maybe the chef currently is uh, busy preparing some other order. So whenever the chef is ready, he can look just look at the note and he will have all the information that, that he needs to prepare that meal for him. And once, uh, yeah, the, the chef prepares his meal, the waiter can take that food back, making sure all the items are there and return it back to the customer. Okay. So this is a simple visualization in a real life where you can see here, uh, you can compare uh, the request uh, to the request from the customer that they need some sort of food. And uh, uh, like chef as a end, end object. So direct interaction with uh, a request and an object could result in some different complications, which we'll look more into. Uh, but having some sort of middle ground uh, where the request can go through that middle ground to the end object, it would solve a lot of problems and support uh, additional functionalities, which again, we'll look into in some time. Yeah. Uh, and the programming related uh, example could be an editor application. Okay, so consider, okay, now we have this, uh, this right, this uh, PowerPoint web application, right? And this web application, it has uh, all these buttons in the toolbar, right? 
So these buttons, uh, they all have uh, a specific functionality attached to them. And assuming, sorry, assuming that, that uh, all these buttons are, uh, uh, I mean, created from a base button UI, right? And uh, assuming that there is no middle uh, ground between this button and its handler. So uh, assume that this is a button uh, and we've, uh, in, in, we've designed a draw button based from that base button. And then uh, there is handler for that button, right? For that uh, draw button. And then there is design button. And for this design button also, there is another handler here, uh, which will handle its fun uh, specific functionality. And then there is all these other buttons, right? So now what's going to happen is whenever we change something within the base button, okay, maybe we've uh, changed uh, uh, the event name from on click to something else. We'll have to change that uh, listening strategy or some other different parameters, which additional parameters, which this button might pass into in its handlers. Okay, so the handlers would need to be, uh, I mean, for simple cases where we have just a simple uh, two, three buttons and two, three handlers, it won't be that complicated. But when we have uh, this complex uh, application where uh, we would support a lot of different operations from the toolbars and all that. So for example, here uh, we have undo operation here and cut, paste and copy operation, right? So for cut, uh, paste and copy operation, we can also use uh, our shortcut keys or some something else, right? So, but uh, linking directly that handler to the button would make uh, it difficult because for button handler, the command, I mean, the copy command would do something else. And for shortcut, we need to have some other handler where the code would be duplicated, right? So, as our application grows, as its complexity grows, having direct one-to-one -one relation from request to an object, end object, could uh, result in a lot of complication and redundancies. Okay, so what uh, what we can do, uh, we can have some sort of middle ground. Okay, and that middle ground would just have to take in a command. Okay, so this button, it would just, uh, for example, this button insert it would just uh, take in a, uh, this request from the user that, okay, this user clicked insert button and it would just pass uh, pass it along to that middle ground. And that middle ground, it could, uh, it could then, uh, okay, this is the request. It could then uh, process that command uh, to the handler. It could just pass that command back to the handler uh, with a common uh, executing logic. Maybe it will have uh, a, a dot execute method or run method. Okay. And that, uh, I mean, doing that, it will allow us to, uh, you know, support, uh, have a record of all the commands that were done, maybe using a shortcut key, maybe when we paste something or remove something, it will help us uh, have some sort of middle ground where we store all the history of things which we've done. For editors, we know how important it is to do undo or redo, right? And uh, it will allow us to do undo and redo when we have that. Right. Cool. Now that is clear. Uh, let's look into a simple example of how we can implement this, okay? With a simple, cool example. Okay, let me start the presentation again. Start from, you know, let's see. Hopefully it takes the current slide. Oh God, no. <laughs> okay, what happened? Okay, how do I start from the current slide? Just a second. Command. Yeah, we were here. Hmm. Click on, <clears throat> click on slideshow or tab. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. 
so we've seen mm, some examples I mean, let, let's see this example okay we have a simple example in node.js how we can have this middle ground between a command i mean request and uh, its handler so here as you can see we've imported a read line module of node.js and uh, read lines create interface method which just basically defines what the input input stream and output stream should be here we have a process is, i mean the nodes uh, standard input and standard output for now and uh, we have a command uh, i mean we have defined uh, the commands which we support here we, that is create file name and text and exit for now and it just prompts uh, to the in to the output right and prompts as in takes ready to take the input from the interface command line interface and here when we receive a, a input from the line uh, what we are doing is we just parsing the input so that we know which which uh, uh, which uh, text to consider file name which to consider te uh, text and all that and uh, and then once we are done with that uh, we extract the command right and we just pass it along uh, to its a particular handler so right now here as you can see there's nothing here it's just console logging the command which we got and if we don't support have any command which which support it's just defaulting it right so now let's see how we can refactor this with some sort of middle ground okay mm, okay i think this is not clear here let me go back to our editor cool here let's see the command pattern now let's try to run the raw code which we have before refactoring okay mm. command raw next which is okay it, it prompted us uh, that okay these are the commands we support let's try doing create uh, hello.txt hello and it just logged out the things which were here right so it's a simple there's nothing complicated here okay and then let's go to how we can go about to refactor this okay now let's see the refactored version of it so uh, i hope this is uh, visible so here we've uh, Im imported a uh, something called conductor and uh, we've imported uh, some commands create and exit commands uh, from a different module and the uh, rest of it is exactly the same except that we have some different uh, commands which we are supporting now okay so here are all the list of all the commands which we are supporting for now and uh, here everything is exactly the same except that uh, the commands which we get now are going through uh, this conductor okay so the conductor here is acting as a middle ground and it's making sure it's taking in the command and it's run uh, doing a run without having to know what the command is it's just going to run it okay cool let's look into how this conductor is uh, implemented okay okay let's first see the commands which we have so we've imported uh, two commands right exit command and create command so let's see how they are implemented and here uh, for the commands we are just uh, importing a nodes file system module and path module and uh, exit is just going to uh, just going to do exit i mean it's just going to end the nodes process uh, when it uh, does when we do uh, execute when it, i mean all the commands should have some common method which uh, our uh, conductor can call okay so here exit command has uh, this execute method which is just going to do process.exit and the create command it's going to uh, create a new file yeah it's going to create a new file with the uh, nodes write file method and uh, here for now the callback is just an empty callback it's not going to do anything okay and undo here when we create a file we've supported an undo command for a create command so that 
uh, when the file is created and the user want to undo that, we can just unlink it from the file system and the file will get deleted. And uh, let's look how the conductor is implemented now. Okay. So this is our conductor. It's a simple, it has a simple constructor as we can, uh, as we already discussed, it will hold uh, different uh, two arrays. It will hold uh, history uh, of commands, which, we, which it got and uh, the uh, commands which were undone. I will see how this is going to be useful. So it has a, a common run, I mean, it has a run method, main run method, which takes in a command. And on that command, it's going to do execute. And we've already seen that every command which we've implemented here has supports an execute method, right? Cool. And it's going to push that uh, executed command onto the history. And uh, we have another uh, method here, since we are storing all the history of commands which we've uh, uh, which we've uh, triggered, so we can have something like print history where we show all the commands which were uh, executed so far. And then there is undo method. And what this undo method is going to do is just going to pop the last uh, history uh, command, last uh, command from the history. And then uh, on that command, it's going to do undo. If that command supports undo, then uh, the undo operation happens. We've seen that for create command, we're supporting undo command, right? Exit doesn't have any undo because we can't do anything once the node is done. Nodes process is done, right? And then there is redo. Since we've undone one command, we are pushing that into undone's array. And uh, if we need to redo that command, what we can do is simply uh, pop out the last undone command from the undone array and we can execute it. Hope this is clear. Now let's try to run everything, okay? Let's see how everything is working out. So now let's go into our refactored code and do index.js. And it's uh, giving us uh, that these are the supported commands. Let's create some files. Mm. Now, yeah, it's saying execute the command, executed the command and it executed it and it created a new file. Okay, let's create another file just so that we can. Okay, so you've seen there's another file now, okay. Now let's see the history, okay? There's a history command, right? Which is supporting, let's see history of commands and it's popping out the uh, commands which we triggered, executed. And now let's try to uh, undo, okay? Let's uh, do undo. And what it should uh, technically do, it should uh, pop out the last command which was executed and it should unlink this file, right? Let's see. So yeah, as we can see that file is gone now. Cool, now let's try to redo it. Cool. And this is a simple uh, example where having a middle ground between our first initial request to a final object where that request needs to be processed can be helpful in these sorts of command scenarios. Okay. Okay, cool. Let's, uh, can we do undo a couple of times? Delete all the files from there and exit from here. Cool. So, yeah, this is what a command design pattern would look like. Well, let's get back onto our slides. Yeah, so we've seen how having a middle ground between a initial request and final object can be very helpful. So, command design pattern will help us. Uh, work that. Cool. <clears throat> now let's look into uh, a new behavioral design pattern. I mean, another behavioral design pattern, another common behavioral design pattern, iterator pattern called iterator. And let's read through the definition of what iterator pattern is. So the gang of four, they define the intent of this iterator 
as to providing a way to access the elements of an aggregate object. Uh, an aggregate object, it could be like a sort of a simple list or stack of elements or trees, etc. Okay, sequentially without exposing its underlying representation. Okay, so uh, I mean, again, with within itself, it's the definition is not clear of what exactly it's trying to. Let's look into our example. So, yeah, so considering a real life example. Uh, consider uh, there is a tourist in a in a new foreign country, and uh, he doesn't have any guides with him. Okay, and uh, what's going to happen is, uh, he'll just uh, I mean he won't know what he's doing, right? He he might be just circling uh, through the entire city, and uh, he might miss the main attractions of the city. Um, yeah, so that's the one one case but having some sort of guide maybe a mobile a smartphone with a maps on it uh, that uh, with that with the help of that he can uh, make sure he hits all the main uh, spots which are uh, uh, i mean yeah sightseeing and he, he may he can make sure that he he doesn't miss any such spots worth visiting and that's one uh, example where he can make use of a smartphone and another example could be he can make use of a guide, a local guide who has a better experience of uh, how, where everything is good food and where they can shop for cheap and all that. So here, uh, the two examples, the phone, a smartphone and a guide, they, uh, they help uh, serve as an iterator. Okay, like we can compare them with an iterator who will make sure that this tourist uh, has a clear way of iterating through that city, at least uh, going about the city. And uh, in programming term, uh, we can compare, uh, we can think of uh, uh, like consider a complex data structure like trees, right? So in trees, there can be many ways of tra tra uh, traversing from uh, root element to its parent uh, child and all that, right? So we know that there can be uh, something called depth first, depth first iterator, where uh, we basically go from the root element uh, down to another root and down, down, down until we hit a leaf, and then we go back to uh, go back to root and then continue the process. And there can also be a breadth first uh, uh, iterator where uh, we start from a root, come to a uh, a child, and then go sideways, and then traverse through that. Okay. So here, uh, our uh, collection is tree, right? So we need to support different traversing mechanisms, right? I mean, if we need some sort of mechanism in one situation and another sort of uh, traversing mechanism in different situation, we would have to keep changing this collections class of uh, the way to traverse through the collection. I mean, the collection of uh, aggregate items, right? So what iterator is going to do it's going to separate that uh, implementation of collection from the traversing part of it. So iterator takes a complete responsibility for uh, making sure that it traverses through a given collection without having to know its implementation details. So now what we are going to essentially do is uh, for a single uh, uh, type of collection, we can have multiple iterators, which would uh, make sure that they uh, sorry, which would make sure that uh, based on the requirement, they are, they support different types of traversal uh, mechanisms. Like we've already discussed a uh, depth first traversal on a tree and then there is a breadth first traversal on the tree. So the iterator will make sure that uh, the traversing is supported from that without having to change any uh, uh, implementation logic of the collection itself. Um, yeah, so let's make sense with this, uh, uh, with a simple example in our node application. Okay. So now, yeah, as you can see here, we have something called gallery item. And then there is a list of gallery of TV shows here. Okay. And uh, I assume that this amount here is uh, the amount for buying or purchasing the DVD or set of DVDs. Okay. So this, there's a gallery item on all the list of uh, TV shows. So what we need is uh, 
from this, we need a way so that uh, with our direction keys in our computer, we need to be able to traverse through all these items which the gallery supports uh, with our uh, uh, direction key items in our uh, application. I mean, uh, in our uh, device on our device. So here it simply uh, takes in, I mean, node mod nodes uh, read line module again, and it's uh, uh, subscribing to this emit key press events from the processes uh, standard input. Okay. And here we are doing this set raw mode so that we are making sure we're reading one character at a time. And then, yeah, here we are just logging that okay, press any direction key. And now uh, once there is a, a key press, we are, uh, but we're basically just clearing the line so that uh, we can output these details and uh, moving the cursor. I'll show you how this works out. And now based on the key and if the right key is pressed, uh, we'll, for now we are just uh, simply writing to standard output as uh, okay, right key is pressed. And if there is left key, if the left, left key is pressed, then we'll just uh, writing that left key and all that, okay. And we've not refactored it uh, so that we uh, implement uh, traversal, I mean, uh, iterator for this, but let's, let's look into the code. Okay, let's go to our code again. Hmm. Let's go to iterator and let's look our raw, yeah, behavioral iterator raw, yeah. So here we have a list of all that. And for now we're not having, you don't have any iterator in, implemented. We'll just run this so that we know that, okay, the key listening events are working fine. Okay, so now I'm pressing down, it's showing down uh, because it's writing it out. And when I'm pressing right, it's printing right. If I'm pressing up, it's printing up and left and left. Cool. Now let's see how we can, uh, in, uh, I mean, basically involve an iterator here so that when we do this key presses, we should be able to iterate through this. Okay, cool. Mm. Let's see the refactored code. Let's close this. Yeah, so here, what we've done is we've uh, uh, implemented a new iterator class here and uh, we've uh, uh, passed that, uh, passed our uh, gallery to that iterator as a constructor uh, parameter. And now uh, everything else is same. And based on the key key which we press, uh, then the gallery, which is nothing but iterators object uh, instance, uh, it's going to have, I mean, when we press right key, then it's going to show the next item uh, and okay, let's see how the iterator is uh, implemented first. Okay, uh, iterator. Let's see how the gallery item is implemented. So gallery item is nothing but it just supports the right line. It just writes to the standard output of nodes process the name of the gallery item and its price. Okay, and here in the iterator, we just have a simple constructor wherein it takes the end items and it starts the index from the beginning of that uh, collection, okay, from the root. And this iterator can support multitude of uh, methods. Like it has a first, it's just restructuring uh, the first element from the item and returning it back. And uh, then there is a last. So this uh, first, last and all that, it's returning a gal gallery item, right? We have seen that it's collection of gallery items. So it's going to return a gallery item on which uh, we can simply do a right line uh, where it will log, I mean, we'll write uh, the name and the price onto the uh, console, I mean, process outputs. Uh, yeah. Mm, yeah, it supports first and it supports last and it uh, makes sure that, okay, okay, there's a flag that it, if uh, there's a next element, next item, and uh, the current one. So when we do a right key press, it just checks, okay, uh, is there a next item in that aggregate? And if it's there, it's just going to promote the index and the current method will take that uh, uh, item from the index 
and it's just going to return it on which we'll do the process output and log the name and the price and same for the price and the same and yeah it's just reducing the index and it's returning the current index so let's look all of this in action and we'll go here iterator sorry refactor and then let's do node index.js let's see our collection first okay so now yeah so now i'm pressing the right key now uh, remember the index is set to zero and me pressing right should uh, print the friends right yeah it printed out the friends and if we press right again the south park right again money heist house of cards rick and morty breaking bar press no press now there we have also supported uh uh sorry let's see here up and down we have also supported first and last methods right on this iterator so first uh, by pressing the key up it should take me uh, to game of thrones and by pressing down it should take me to person of trust i'm pressing up now it took me to game of thrones i'm pressing last it took me to person of interest okay so uh, we can uh, just visualize right having this is just a simple uh, aggregate uh, data right but having a complex uh, aggregate objects like trees and all having this I, uh, iterator could uh, uh, simplify her life a lot uh, better and separate that uh, traversal logic from the collection logic itself cool i hope that makes sense so let's look into our uh, next uh, behavioral pattern so we've looked into all this so now we have uh, this observer pattern okay uh, yeah this observer pattern again it's a simple i mean common behavioral pattern which we come across in our applications so here let's read through this definition together so gang of four they define the intent of observer pattern as uh, defining a one to many dependencies between the objects so that one object if one object changes its state all of its dependents are notified and updated automatically okay so i think this is a bit a little bit clearer explanation compared to the rest but still let's look into the examples yeah so a real life example could be uh, subscribing to a newsletter okay so uh people can choose which type of newsletter a particular magazine they can subscribe to and uh, they'll once there is a new uh, pub, uh i mean once a, a new i mean news company publishes a new article and if a person has subscribed to it they'll get it right so this is a simple common uh, analogy which we can relate to and in programming uh, we might have come across like event based triggers right so on a successful transaction we would need uh, to generate a receipt and uh, send payment acknowledgement email and uh, send receipt again to the customer and all that send us sms okay this successful it was successful so uh, we can't have all this logic in a single class or a method right again it's not a good implementation so we would need uh, the object which handles uh, generating a receipt an object which handles uh, email sending and all that and and we need just a way so that all these objects would know whenever a, there was a successful transactions they'll get to know so basically this transaction uh, object is going to be uh, 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 an observable to which uh, this these methods the method which will generate a receipt which will send an acknowledgement email and which will send a receipt can subscribe to this observable and once there is any change like a successful transaction they can just uh, uh, do their own thing right so there can be many examples but this is a simple one which we can relate to right so let's look into an example in our with a simple uh implementation in our application okay so we have uh, this index file wherein we have a store and we have a shopper and we have a mall classes okay 
and we can see this, they are just a simple glasses which just have a name for now and the mall has this uh, something called sales array sorry and yeah this is just a simple thing and there is a shopper class and yeah okay the shopper has a name and store has a uh, something called sale which is just uh, okay we'll look into it uh, let's move forward and we've defined uh, two stores here uh, there is reliance digital and the chroma store to which uh, there are shoppers different shoppers ravi uh, sri sai lekha shubham and there is a mall phoenix mall okay so what we need to implement is uh, whenever uh, this store has some sort of uh, sale going on uh, the interested shoppers like ravi sri sai and shubham they should be able to subscribe to it and whenever there is change in that uh, then they should be able to get to know somehow and the mall i think it's uh, basically recording list of all the sales which are going on in shops okay so let's see how we can refactor this code to implement that simple observable and subscriber logic so here uh, i think the only change we've seen we see here is that we've included uh, the shop here reliance digital and it subscribed ravi and ravi subscribed basically to reliance digital sri sai subscribed lucky subscribed and the mall also subscribed to the reliance digital store and the the mall again subscribed to the chroma store and shubham also subscribed to this so now what the store is doing this reliance digital it's uh, uh, triggering something a uh, sale method with uh, a discount uh, price off okay so once this does when, once this store does this so what's going to happen is all the subscriber which it recorded for its uh, in its database will get to know somehow okay there's a sale going on and the mall it will just list out all the sales which were uh, recorded in its stores cool i hope the implementation is clear let's look into our uh, code and see how this works all of it is put together okay so let's go into our uh, Uh, there's nothing in the raw code. Let's see the refactored code. Yeah. So here, uh, we've subscribed. The store has subscribed uh, shoppers, right? So let's see how uh, the mall has been refactored. The mall has something called notify method, which uh, has a store name and a discount, and it's uh, uh, it's just uh, recording that sale in its array. Okay. so what shoppers uh, notify is going to do is that uh, it's just uh, taking this name of the shopper and then there is a sale at the store name and the discount price so both the mall and the shopper has something called a notify method which the store will invoke whenever it has sale right so this is the store in here uh, there is something called subscribe method which is nothing but is just going to push everyone who have subscribed to the store into an array right mm, yeah into an array and once there is a sale going on uh, what this uh, this is going to do store is just going to invoke the notify method on its subscribers which we have seen that both mall and the shopper has notify methods uh, recorded on in their uh, object right let's see how uh, this works out cool now let's uh, go back to our uh, observer and then do okay sorry i need to go into refactor hmm and then run node index which is so here since uh, ravi sri sai lucky and phoenix mall subscribe to reliance digital and when the reliance digital uh, uh, invoke that there is a sale of 20% going on then let's comment this one for now then all the subscribers should get to know right except shubham because shubham hasn't subscribed for reliance digital yeah so we can see ravi sri sai and lucky got to know that there is sale of 20% at reliance digital and the store has recorded uh, that okay there is one uh, store which is uh, which has a sale in it okay because uh, phoenix mall subscribed to the reliance digital let's uncomment this and save and see 
you know, we have two stores who are uh, uh, having a sale going on and Shubham also. Shubham, there's a sale at Chroma, 50% off of everything. So this is a simple uh, basic example of how an observer and uh, a subscriber would be implemented in our applications. But uh, Node uh, supports a lot more complicated uh, functionalities since Node is event-driven uh, language. So we can uh, do like extend an event emitter and then emit uh, some sort of named event and then sub listen uh, to those events. Got it? Cool. So this is uh, an observer. We have uh, observer design pattern. So let's uh, look into our uh, final. I think it's the last one for now. Yeah, so the strategy pattern. This is our last behavioral pattern which we'll discuss now. Yeah. So strategy pattern, it simply defines, uh, the gang of four defines strategy as a family of algorithms uh, which encapsulate each one and make them interchangeable. And the strategy lets the algorithm vary independently from the clients that use it. I think it's not very clear. Uh, let's look into an example, okay? Cool. So a real life example uh, could be a person traveling to some destination, say an airport, okay? If I need to travel to an airport, uh, I need to make, uh, I, I need to, I, I have different strategies which I can pick up, right? I can walk to the airport if it's nearby or I can cycle to the airport. I can take a taxi or uh, have a friend uh, drop me there. So uh, I'll pick any one of these strategies based on some parameters like uh, like how soon I want to get to the airport and how much budget do I have. So based on all those parameters, I would pick one uh, type of strategy to get to the airport, okay? So this is a, uh, some uh, thing we can relate to. And then in programming, uh, we can think that uh, whenever we are uh, at the, a uh, payment screen of uh, like checking out our out our cart of items which we want to buy. Uh, then the payment, I mean the service like Amazon or Flipkart, they'll give us a multitude of options to choose from, right? So which payment method to choose? Like we can choose a payment through credit card or debit card or payment through a different external service like Paytm or something else, right? So. Uh, internally, all we are concerned about is uh, invoking something called dot pay method so that we can uh, uh, take the amount from users accounts. And then we can, we would also support additionally a refund method if a uh, user cancels it somehow for some reason, then we can invoke that on uh, a common payment, uh, right? So what we, uh, what having the strategy uh, could help us is we can uh, implement all the new services like a credit card service or debit card service as a new strategy and pass on to a common payment service method and invoke dot pay so that uh, all the payment related logic could be handled by that uh, this what we call for the strategy itself so this method doesn't have to do anything and then there can be different login logging uh, uh, services right in our applications like we want to log uh, something to a file uh, we want to uh, append a timestamp uh, in uh, our uh, application based on certain type of environment right so again we can make use of the same strategy uh, design pattern and implement that sort of functionality in our application cool so now let's look into how a simple how we can uh, implement that in our code okay yeah, so let's uh, implement a logger strategy. So uh, here uh, we can see this is our index file and the, here we are importing a common logger class and in that logger class, that logger object supports a log method which just takes in the message and uh, it does something, right? It does something, log method does something based on what it's supposed to do. And then there's logger class here, as we can see for now, it's consoling, logging the message to the console and uh, pushing the log uh, in, in a common right here, right? And we've uh, instantiated it as a singleton, cool. 
yeah and this is straightforward right here we are not using any strategies it's just simply uh, logging things to console uh, now let's see how we can refactor this uh, logging service to uh, use different strategies right cool yeah so having implementing uh, implemented strategies in our logger class what we can do is we can just uh, uh, invoke something called stretch strategy to some some sort of strategy so that these logs uh, will do something else and after setting a different strategies these logs uh, apparently they log uh, the logs to the file right so let's see how we implement this logger i think this is not clear let me go into the code yeah strategy log so now first let's look uh, how these are printing out okay so this is our raw code it's just going to print uh, the logs to the console right so let's do that and let's go into our strategy mm, and then we just do node index.js okay we have to do raw here cool node index.js yeah as we saw it's just uh, this raw example is just taking the timestamp current timestamp and it's appending to the message right cool now let's see how we've refactored this logger uh, service to use strategies so here we've uh, implemented something called stretch strategy right let's see what stretch set strategy does in the logger we have something we've uh, uh, defined a new class here we imported a new class called log strategy and uh, yeah and there is something called config config file so this config file could be something of a common a configuration file which can have different environments here right so based on the environment it will uh, implement a new different strategy it will use a new strategy for logging the uh, logs messages okay so let's uh, see what the logger is doing, what it has. So it says strategy is just setting a strategy. And uh, once we have a strategy, we are just uh, sending our message and a timestamp to that strategy so that that strategy can handle it however it wants based on the strategy's functionality, right? So as we see here, uh, by default, we are trying to uh, I mean, if a node environment was passed, we are taking that uh, strategy from the node environment. Otherwise, we are defaulting it to none. So let's see what log strategy uh, is doing. Okay. So this log strategy, it is just uh, 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 taking, it, it just has some static methods. So I think, I hope you all know that static method, with the static methods, we don't have to invoke instantiate an object we can just do log strategy and invoke the methods in it okay so it has these uh, strategies there is a two more code strategy and there is no date strategy and there is two file strategy and there is two console strategy and again there is none strategy so based on the strategy which we either pick up from the environment um, or uh, the one which we set here manually uh, the logger are going to be handled appropriately. Got it. So let's uh, for uh, uh, changing the log to the Morse code, we are using a new other uh, external library called Morse from Node Packet Manage Package Manager, uh, which will uh, change our logs to a Morse code. So let's see. Uh, so let's not pass any you know, environment variable. Let's just do. Okay, I have to change it to refactored. Now I do index.js. Here, let's see. Here, what we are doing is, as we saw, that if we're not passing any node environment, it's by default set to none. So the first three logs, they are not going to be printed anywhere. They are just going to just go through an empty function and come back. And then we've set the strategy to file. So it will print, it will create a new file and push these logs to that file. Okay, so let's run this. So as we saw, there's no log in the consoles, but uh, we created a new file and we've uh, recorded the logs below 
uh, returns part two and all that to a text file right based on the strategy and if we change the strategy to something else uh, it will since the morse code it's going to log uh, our uh, logs to the console in morse code so we should see that in our console and it should not go in the file right so let's do that we do this so we can see that all our logs below uh, were converted into a morse code and uh, yeah these were some questionable characters which it just couldn't recognize and printed question so uh, yeah you can see that how having different strategies could be useful now let's do something okay let's uh, pass in an environment variable in b wherein let's see what the environment here uh, let's uh, do dev so that we get the logs without any date right so dev node environment is dev node index.js since we are passing uh, this now uh, so the first set of logs are going to be executed right since uh, they are going to find a, a strategy based on the configuration so on dev they're going to print the logs the first set of logs without date and the next set of three logs they're going to print in the morse code right let's see if it works fine so as you can see uh, they printed out without uh, any date the first set of logs and then the next set of logs they printed out uh, in morse code so in this way we can sim uh, implement a simple logging logic in our applications yeah so i think we've covered all the behavioral or design patterns let's see yeah so to summarize uh, all this uh, design patterns are <laughs> really cool and let's keep learning more about them uh, and let's try to use them whenever we find an opportunity in our applications and uh, hopefully let's uh, work uh, enough so that we are able to introduce a new sorts of design patterns and uh, yeah so we have some uh, topics which uh, uh, will be scheduling for our future talks uh, we will discuss uh, structural design patterns wherein we would have something like adapter patterns proxy so we've discussed right structural design patterns would be would have to deal do with how two different objects are put together right in an application and some other design patterns which uh, uh, akshay spoke about so we've referred to some of these resources and uh, hopefully if these slides are shared with you guys so you can go through them if you guys are interested yeah now i think we can take some questions if you guys have any questions akshay and me <sighs> Are there any questions, guys? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah. I request everyone to please uh, fill the feedback form so that uh, we can improve ourselves. And uh, one, we have introduced a section there. Uh, what are the future topics uh, you guys are looking for? So that will help us to decide for the further topics. So, yeah, that's it. Cool. Yeah, if you, uh, I mean, if there's nothing else, maybe we can end it, Kopi. And we will be sharing the uh, yeah. this recording, uh, slide share and the code information on uh, meetup page in sometime in the next week. So in case if you, any one of you want to refer it, so it's available there. And uh, we also have this pattern for the past uh, of our sessions. So in case uh, somebody wants to go either with a node or whatever topics we have covered so far, maybe Angular, React or whatever. So you can go back and have a look and you can also propose the new topics you are looking for. Uh, and we will be conducting this uh, every month. So, yeah. So, okay. Thanks, thanks uh, everyone for your precious time. Yeah, thanks yeah. guys. Yeah. Hopefully you've learned something. Okay, so <laughs> Ankita. Uh, uh, <laughs>
uh, I will uh, like you to sh share your CV, um, but uh, you need to share something with on one of the email. Uh, for currently, I am sharing mine, and uh, you can follow there. Uh, hi Akshay. Yeah, Akshay. Hello. Hi, yes. Yes. Yeah, so I have just have a suggestion. So can we, yes, please. like for net for letter meetups, can we have a series where we can develop an application using Node and Mongo, like connectivity between those? Since I'm a guy from frontend, so I would like to, I'm keen about uh, getting, uh, uh, exploring those area uh, of overall me, uh, means tech development type of. So can we have a series of two to three meetups wherein, wherein we can uh, develop an application uh, focusing on uh, Node and uh, Mongo. Uh, yes, definitely we can. Yeah, we can. The, that sort of uh, thing, and for that, uh, I, in my personal opinion, I think uh, first uh, uh, we should, uh, as a like uh, to focus on the general means uh, all audience, we should first go with the session on MongoDB than the combination of uh, node and mongo i think that will be helpful in the terms like uh, we can discuss more and in depth not only the providing the boilerplate of uh, how we can go with the if you are looking for the boilerplate itself then we can introduce a session where uh, basic uh, in some basic app uh, with the some mongo or whatever the uh, multiple databases as well that that can be a possible Visibility, yeah, we can do this. Sure. So what I'll be expecting is uh, basic CRUD operations. Mm -hmm. So, so as in any guy could like uh, get a touch of it, and it, it can he can means uh, take that application over to uh, work extensively on uh, Mongo and Node. Yeah, sure. So, okay. So, uh, sorry, uh, your good name, please. Uh, my name is Omukar. So, Omkar, can you share your uh, email here so that I can con uh, with, in, connect with you? Sure, sure. I'll, uh, I'm writing it in the mail chat. Yeah, box. sure. Okay, I will connect with you separately. Sure. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, so guys, do, do you have any question regarding uh, current uh, yeah, session so that Azim and Akshay can answer that? Okay. Uh, I said we don't have a question. So my it, uh, session was very nice. Okay, uh, Azim. Okay, so actually, just I, I'm looking forward uh, to how can we develop the application using Node just like um, cloud computing. Okay, like AWS and Azure. So how can we develop the application using the cloud computing? Okay, so that's what actually I'm looking for in next session. So that's my suggestion. If you cover this in next week. Yeah, sure, Vinay. So we'll, we'll plan something. Definitely. Okay, cool. So uh, just uh, on the same ground, uh, this uh, cloud services provide the SDK and uh, also they also provide uh, some sort of basic example how we can make use of their uh, functionalities and uh, implement those as per our custom needs. So yeah, definitely we are going to plan one session over this, but uh, if you are, uh, if you need to pick it a little faster, uh, so then you can refer that as, that as well. So just okay. a pointer in my opinion. Yeah, thanks so yeah, much. Yeah, we'll plan uh, for sure. Yeah. Sure, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, so, Opi, can we uh, can you please share this uh, recorded video because I have already uh, uh, after one hour I have joined. Okay, so can you please share the video link, recorded video link in chat uh, yeah. in comment box. Is chat also you want? I, I don't no, no, not chat. I'm talking about <laughs> the recording session. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Session, uh, so for session, uh, we will be uh, providing this recording in say sometime in the mid of the next week okay uh, yeah sometime in the next week better to say 
okay so i'm i'm i need to do, actually i need to work with the it guys so that takes some time some time so okay. that's the thing okay so similarly i would also expect the code uh, yeah, so sure. that so would be you more will, you will be getting the youtube link uh, slide share link uh, where yeah. this ppt will be and you will be getting the github uh, repo link so where yeah. you can refer with the code base as well yeah fair enough yeah. fair enough thank you so much sure. yeah thank you so thank op you. yeah I, i think we can wrap up right yeah yeah so thank you everyone for your time and efforts and uh, omkar if you are still here so i will connect with you and uh, ankita you can share the cv if you are looking for something uh, sure so do, do i need to stay back in the same call no 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 i will uh, connect you over the email okay that's yeah, fine sure. yeah sure okay yeah. thank you thank okay thank you thank, thank you, you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, fine. Thank you, everyone.